I am just so full. God is so good. Thank you so much for celebrating with me. It's him. Uh, I think of the verse, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's so good. It was so wonderful on Thursday on my birthday to get to take flowers to my doctor, and Stacy took me to Starbucks, and we got a bunch of Starbucks cards for all of my nurses, and um, as I handed them to them, I, I mean, it, wasn't, it was a $15 gift card, but they were so stunned that I was giving out on my birthday, and I said, well, I would not be here if you didn't take such good care of me. And um, they, there's, uh, there needs to be more thank yous for nurses. Um, nurses are powerful life support. And um, so it was a blessing that day to be able to tell everybody it's my 50th birthday and it's four years after I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, and um, I, it's a gift. I know it sounds like a terrible thing, but it really is a gift to get the memo that one day it will be over, and we only have so much time, and I, I take it as a gift. So every decision, everywhere I spend my time, every investment um, has to be filtered through that lens of is it God's purpose? And is it worthy of the life that I live? And you are the most worthy. And I could not be happier to be here. I have missed you the past few weeks so much. But thank you for and to our team. What a powerful, amazing team that we have um, to allow me to be able to, yes, take a few weeks and enjoy being a grandmother and get in the groove of it. I'll, I'll, I'll be good in practice by the time our new little baby boy will be here in just, what, like two weeks maybe? He's like really close, um, and we can't wait. So you'll be seeing pictures of him. I'm sorry, not sorry, um, <laughs> but it's, it's what the Lord has done, and I'm gonna celebrate every single moment of it. Uh, it makes me better um, to be grateful, as it does all of us. But today I want to continue this series. It, can we just dive in today into the Word of God? I want to continue. Uh, what we're speaking about is God's blueprint. God has a plan. Probably the number one question I get from people I'm able to sit down with and have a conversation or counsel is, I want to know God's plan for my life. I don't know what God's will is for me. How do I find that? Well, today, this message has the power to shed some light on possibly things you could be doing better or more of to participate in God's plan for your life. I'm gonna outline this for us today, and we're gonna even get into one of my favorite things that happens when you read the Bible is contradictions, what appears to be a contradiction. So we're gonna talk through that on the subject today of holiness. Holiness is one major way we participate in God's plan for our lives. So I don't know what you think of when you think of the word holy. Holy or whole is one of those words in the English language that can be spelled three or four different ways and mean many different things. It's not the kind of holy that you have in a sock. It is holy mean, means set apart. It means dedicated or consecrated for one specific particular purpose. Now, you may not have anything you deem holy, you use the word for in your house or in your life, but God calls certain things holy. I did a message, spoke on it about two years ago, called The History of Holiness. It's in our archives if you ever wanna go watch, but it goes through everything God declared to be holy. And I can give you a couple of those because there is a definite pattern Anything he called holy is something undefiled by the world, untouched by the world. The tithe is called holy. It means it's dedicated for only God's purpose, nothing else. The Sabbath is holy. What does the Sabbath and tithe have in common? Nothing else is to, to encroach. It is sacred. It is, has a guard around it, a protection. 
The other things he calls holy is the temple of the Lord. You and I are called the temple of the Holy Spirit. He calls his people holy. But there is an act of holiness, especially in the Old Testament, where it is separateness from the defiled, profane, or impure. I would probably say the holiest thing in my household is my toothbrush. I do not want that to be used for anything else than brushing my teeth. So I think toothbrushes are one of the best cleaning materials that you can use in a house. I'll get after a toilet, I will get after my, my oven and my, my stove and my sinks under the lip of the sink. I mean, I love using a toothbrush, but I don't wanna use the one I'm using to brush my teeth. So when I retire my toothbrush, I put painter's tape around the bottom so that the cleaning lady knows you can now use this. Well, one morning I was late for work and I was brushing my teeth as I went into the kitchen and I rinsed my, my toothbrush and I rinsed my mouth and left my toothbrush sitting there. I forgot it was a Thursday and that's the day that she comes every other week to help us clean. And so when I got back later that night, I was looking for my toothbrush, it's time for bed, couldn't find it. Another thing I do with things that are important to me that I would call holy, like my wedding ring, my toothbrush, is I always know where I put it, right? Put it in the same place. Then you never have to worry about losing it when you care about something. So it wasn't where it was supposed to be. And then I retraced my steps and went, oh yes, this morning I was late. It has to be in the kitchen. Went back in the kitchen. It wasn't there. I looked underneath and found the one toothbrush that did not have painter's tape on it and the bristles were going in every direction. It had some kind of black residue in the bottom and I recognized, okay, it's no longer holy. It's no longer set apart. It has been used for God knows what. So I'm headed to CVS to get another toothbrush because this one has been defiled. So this gives you a picture of holy is set apart. Everything doesn't get used in the same way. There are some things we say, this is sacred. Nothing else touches this. This is important to me. It's set apart. So that is the meaning of holiness. But I want to question us today and just set the challenge. What does holiness look like in everyday life? And how does it impact our relationships and our choices. So if you'll go with me to 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, we're gonna read a passage about holiness. Verse 14 says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Recognize that word Belial is a name. It is a proper noun, it's capitalized here. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, and here he quotes the Old Testament, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. 17 says, therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. This passage is about holiness. Holiness in everyday life. We're gonna start with the first description he gives. He gives us a charge at the beginning and he says, do not be yoked with unbelievers. Now this is used often when coaching people who are single and dating and it's often referred to the verse as it's memorized is do not be unequally yoked, right? This is not the yellow part of the egg that you eat for breakfast. This is a yoke, Y-O-K-E, not a yolk, Y-O-L-K. A yoke is a large wooden beam that would be placed and carved with shoulder joints to go over the neck and shoulders of two oxen. So when they were yoked together, they would then pull the plow in one direction. When you are yoked together, 
You are only going the same direction. You cannot go in two separate destinations. There is one way. So to be yoked, that means to be pulled together, to be stuck, to be attached to an unbeliever. If you're a believer, then you've given your heart and your life to God. Your purpose then is sealed with him. He has a plan for you. That means every morning when you wake up, the Holy Spirit is waiting and ready to say, I've got this on the agenda for you today. I've got a divine appointment set up for you. I've got resources and relationships. I'm ready to hook you up. We got a destination. This is why Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and my burden for it is, it's weightless, the Bible says. It's, it's easy, it's not heavy. Why? Because he's pulling most of the weight. He knows where he's called you to go. And he is ready and waiting for you to come in agreement with the path he has for your life. But when you wake up and you are already yoked to something else or someone else that is going in a different direction than the Holy Spirit would take you, this is the problem. If you are yoked together, think of two oxen. This is what farmers would do. When they wanted to get one new oxen trained, they would put a young one, young, big, strong, but untrained, they would put with an older, subservient, gentle oxen. That, you may think, is what the Bible says when it says don't be unequally yoked. You may picture yourself as some strong spiritual giant being yoked to some smurf of a spirit. It's not about size and scale. What it's about unequally yoked is about having two different destinations. Your mindset being surrender to God's will, you cannot be yoked with someone else who has a different destination. And if they are an unbeliever, then they are bent to the pattern of this world. And if they're bent to the pattern of this world, that means they wake up striving. That means they spend their whole day leaning and yearning for affirmation. They need somebody to tell them they're worth it and that they're worth something and that they're worthy of love and that they can achieve something. All day is about the pressure and meeting up to the pressure. If you're called and you are a believer and you've given your life to the Lord, then that doesn't match with the destination you're called to in the kingdom. Because you start the day as a believer already sealed, already chosen, already called, already anointed, already affirmed, already loved, already blessed, already provided for, already covered, already protected. That's how you start the day as a believer. But this is why this verse is so important when it says, what does Christ have in common with Belial? Belial here is, the word to belie means to lie, to deceive. So because it's capital, then we know what Paul is referring to, the adversary, as the liar, the author of lies. So when he calls Belial, he's saying, what does truth, Christ is truth, what does truth have in common with a lie? Are you going to wake up every morning as a believer, blood bought, wake up and you begin listening to this internal liar that masquerades with your voice? See, this is the thing, you think the devil's gonna show up with a pitchfork and tell you who he is. He doesn't, he uses your voice. Or the voice of someone, a mother, a father, a teacher, someone who speaks words or tone of disqualification. And this is what's also interesting, is when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he also uses your voice. It comes with a, a peace, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom will come and you think you thought of it. See, that's the issue is when it's the enemy or when it's the Lord, you, if you think you thought of it, if you think it's you, you're already going down the wrong track. Because you, when you think it's you, this, oh man, this will preach right here. I'm about to tell y'all something. So what I learned about cancer and all the new cancer research is going toward helping the immune system identify cancer as an intruder. 
The reason why cancer has not been cured and the reason why it grows unchecked in your body when the flu or COVID or anything else will trigger your immune system is because those viruses are seen as invaders. They come from the outside in. The problem with cancer is it's, it's a dysfunction from the inside out. So your immune system does not recognize anything that originates from within as a threat. It's the same thing with the voice that you're listening to. You'll entertain the liar, Belial, because you think it's just you. You think, oh, the enemy comes to you and says, see, this happened to you when you're young, and then it happened again, and then it happened again, and then it happened again. See, and nobody likes you. God doesn't have a plan for you. Here's the evidence. These are the experiences. You think that's you in all your wisdom, putting the pieces of the puzzle together, and it's not. It is Belial, the liar that has come to you to say, I cannot move you from your place of authority. But what I can do is convince you to be yoked to a lie, and I can drag you out of your purpose. Because if you come into agreement with a lie, that is a yoke, that is a covenant. So as believers, we then are supposed to say, I will not be yoked, I will not come into agreement. Because we tell the enemy as a liar, what you're doing to me is working. You know how this happens? Because I watch this with myself. Is I'll hear something in my head and I start believing it, woe is me, or this is not for my benefit, or somebody is against me, or somebody said something, and I start building a case. It's really the enemy building a case. But I start entertaining all the evidence. Show me the evidence, yeah, I'll hear you out. And then once I've heard him out, then I might go to the kitchen and get my coffee, and I'm starting my day, and somebody comes in, and I'm just kinda like, mm. Starts with a little attitude. Then the enemy goes, ooh, it's working. She already's taken the bait. Today, I'm gonna turn a bad five minutes and a bad email into a bad 24 hours. So then it moves from just a little bad attitude to Stacy asking me how I am and how things are. And I'm like, well, I could be better, but this is what happened and, th and so this is what I think. And immediately the enemy goes, all right, now she's amplifying and broadcasting my voice. I can use her. So throughout the day, how many people do you think I could use Amy to discourage today? Let me see. How many people could be influenced by her negativity? I'm going to try that out. I want you to see this because what communion, what relationship does truth have with a lie? If we'll believe everything we think without checking it against the will and the word and the way of God, we'll be in trouble because we think we're plowing a straight line. No, we're pulled to the left and we're pulled to the right by wherever our flesh directs us. And then what happens, we fall into discord. The rest of this verse Another important word used here that connects us to holiness is the word harmony. This is the word he uses between Christ and Belial. What harmony is there? I don't know how musical all of you are, but you don't have to be very musical to, to understand when you hear discord. You know when it's off, right? When there is a, a key or a note that is in discord, it's not in harmony. Harmony doesn't mean all the same notes. It's not unison. Unison is singing the same note. Harmony is singing different, um, um, what is the word? Um, comp complementary notes. But when there's discord, when a lie just does not sound right with everything else that God said to you, that's how you know this is a lie. This doesn't fit. If God was against me, he wouldn't have put me in the family he did. If God was against me, he wouldn't give me the friends he did. If God was against me, he wouldn't let me be in this country where I have liberty and opportunity. If God was against me, I wouldn't be breathing right now and have health and, 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 and future. If God was against me, but see, we get, okay, God's against me because this one door shut. God's against me because this one thing hasn't happened yet. And we begin entertaining the enemy. There's discord. 
Lack of unity. See, one thing I noticed about the word holiness, whatever you think of it, is many people, like the song we sang earlier, the anthem in heaven is gonna be holy, holy, holy. So one day we will graduate from this place where there still is the presence of sin. So when you're saved, you are released and relieved from the penalty of sin. That means the the everlasting penalty, heaven or hell. But we still live in a world where there is the presence of sin. Ultimately, when we enter eternity, we will no longer be affected by the presence of sin. We'll be in a holy place and we will be made holy. But we're not just supposed to look at holiness as something for the hereafter. Holiness is about the here and now. Holiness is about how we live a better life. If you want unity and not discord, then the Bible calls us to harmony with truth, not with a lie. The next word that he uses here that's powerful is agreement. He says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? And I just want to leave this question kind of sit here. How many gods can you have? There are a couple religions that have five, 800 gods. People can't even remember the names of these gods. And I wanna think, do any of them have any power whatsoever? You don't even know what they're here for. They're just, they're rock, they're statues. We have one living God and he has one name, Jesus. And he is powerful and nothing else should ever stand in the place of his presence. He should come first. But what do idols look like in our life? So if we want harmony, if we want to be yoked with believers and with purpose, I want to remind you of the scripture in Amos 3.3 that says, can two people walk together without agreeing on the destination? I think that's important for you. I know there are high schoolers in the room today, maybe even junior high kids and younger You know, I went to Newman Smith High School, just down the street. I was in private school for three years during my junior high, most formative years, before that public school as well. And when I was put back in public school, um, I I did not feel that I really fit in. And um, I knew that I could put effort toward fitting in. And there were times when I was tempted Um, when a guy from my biology class and had a red Porsche invited me to go to homecoming with him, I was really tempted to step into that circle. And I remember going home, talking to my mom about it and deciding to tell him no. He's a sweet guy. Um, He was a Christian. He went to First Baptist, which is right across the street from Newman Smith. Um, But I knew in that moment that there was a decision and probably you gained just from knowing me and the way that you do that I am a bit serious. And at that age, I was, I was still very serious. And so I looked at it and said, you know, I could do this, I could go, but there may be no return. Right now, I can come in and I can leave and I am undefiled. I have friends, they know me. In fact, we have people that attend this church now that went to high school with me and um, they talk about me being a light, but for me, it was all about being a lantern. I'm like, I'm a light, but I do have a boundary. I don't go where everybody goes. I don't party the way everybody else parties. And the reason for that is because I wanted to preserve what I knew God had put in me. So it was all about saying no to other things, to create space. It felt like I was in a greenhouse, if you will. And I knew that I saw my friends that would have a boyfriend, they made a different decision, and then when it was time to go to youth camp in the summer with the church, they chose not to go because he wasn't going. One decision after the next, their, their plowing line ended up going a different direction than what we had all talked about being called to. There are seasons in your life that are gonna be lonely and isolating. It isn't God against you. It is God preserving you, saying there's something I have for you to do that nobody else can do. And you can't make a difference if you aren't different. So I need to preserve the purpose on you by you being set apart. Come into agreement with it. Stop looking at it like it's rejection. 
It's God wanting to do something. It's not just sitting in a waiting room for your destiny. There's something you should be doing in this season to participate in God's plan for your life. Holiness is for how we live. Now I wanna bring you one of my favorite things to do, and this is a juxtaposition. I don't know if this young lady's here, but it was cute. Um, I'm looking around to see, I don't see her, but she came up to me in the altar one day and, and she said, I don't understand because the Bible says we're supposed to be salt and light, um, but in the world, you're not supposed to be salty. (laughs) And I said, well, I don't think that that Jesus was using the Urban Dictionary (laughs) to describe. Let's talk about really what salt means, because to be salty now is to have a bad attitude, right? So... I love it when people come forward and say, what does the Bible mean when it says this? It seems so contrary. Well, sometimes the Bible seems to contradict itself. And right here, I want you to see the verses we just read in 2 Corinthians say, come out. Don't touch any unclean thing and come out from among them. But now we're about to read Jesus' words right after the resurrection. What was his direction for his disciples? It's active word for us today. Matthew 16, 15 and 20, Jesus said this. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Verse 20, then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So he blessed the word and directive that he gave him. So my question is, do we go into all the world or come out and be separate? Which one is it? Huh? Both. Both because both is the gospel. Both is come out, be changed, be restored, be renewed, and then go back in, bringing the good news of the gospel and rescue those that are still lost. It is both. Come out so that you don't look like, you don't sound like, you don't walk like, you don't act like. Let me transform you from the inside out so that then you can go into the world and make a difference. We cannot make a difference unless and until we are different. Our vision at Covenant Church is to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. If you're the same temperature, you can't raise the temperature. You have to be different. What makes you different is time with God. That's what makes you different. That is the only factor that will cause us to make a difference that is eternal. A lot of people raise money to make a difference, but is it eternal? What God has called you to do is make an eternal impact. And how do we do that? We come out. So to participate in God's plan, to share the gospel means go into all the world, but how do we go into all the world without all the world going into all of us? That's the big question. How do you impact or change something when you're in it? I want to give you the example of submarines or even a spacecraft When we are entering a foreign environment, an environment that we are not made for, I want you to think about a submarine, how there is a, for every submarine, a crush depth. You can ask the question, what is the crush depth? They don't know. All they know is it's the point of no return. So we always want to stay about 200 feet above the crush depth. So they do what they call dive tests where they will take a submarine down a little at a time, and as the pressure from the outside pushes in on the environment on the inside, any cracks, any leaks will show up. See, this is what the the Lord allows. You spend time with him, and he helps create an internal environment that is stronger than the external pressures of this world. Same with spacecraft. They've got to make sure that the pressure, what's pushing, what's created and what is pushing outward is stronger than what is pushing against. This only happens with time spent with the Lord. 
If you don't have a greater purpose pushing outward, you cannot hold yourself together in a world designed to crush the life out of you. You've got to be in but not of. That is the definition of holiness, to be in the world but not of the world. So that means when you wake up in the morning and you look at social media and all your friends are out buying rice and beans and they're scared, you go, Holy Spirit, do I need to buy rice and beans? Or is this just the world pushing in on me? When everybody's on there and they're all upset about the election and all the the bad choices we have (laughs) in the future to make, um, you can go, God, I'm not gonna get stirred up by that. You're in control. I am in, but not of. Even though the United States has been a light, a city set on a hill, it is not the kingdom of God. So I am here to produce the kingdom of God. What do I do today to show that I come from an unshakable kingdom? I'm not supposed to be shaken the way everybody is on the outside. Why? Because there's something internal that has a higher degree of impetus on my destiny and my purpose. What is pushing out, what I'm called to produce is so much greater than what people put upon me. Expectations will melt like wax if you begin spending time with the Holy Spirit saying, God, what have you called me to do? It doesn't matter what my mama, what my daddy, what my grandma, what my best friend, what my boyfriend, their opinion. What is your opinion about my life? In this season, I feel really compelled to let go in asking myself the same question I'm gonna leave with you today. What areas of your life need to be sanctified? What things need to become sacred? Is there any space in your schedule right now for the Holy Spirit? Look at your schedule. Look at your finances. That'll tell you your priorities. And then go, God, according to where I'm investing myself, look at your words. So we always talk about time, talent, treasure. I'm gonna add tongue to that. Because whatever you are using those things, that is where all your energy is going. You're building whatever that is that those things are pointed at. Look at what that is. And then when you look at what that is, say, God, how can I become more set apart and holy for your purpose? Right now, I give you 10 minutes a day in the morning praying. What else can I do? What else can I do? How can I add to that? What things can I say no to? So for us to be holy, holiness will preserve our purpose in the middle of pressure, but the identity of holiness is really important. I wanna set the record straight here about holiness. I don't know what your picture is about holiness. A toothbrush now, I've given you a couple examples, but holiness in our family um, had a very distinct um, mark and identity. Both my parents were raised in the Pentecostal holiness movement. A specific denomination that they were raised in, my mother was in California. It's it's split up into districts, and so the California district was much stricter on what they called standards for dress and attire than my dad, who was in the Texaco district. And all the rules, by the way, are for, for the women. As a side note. (laughs) So the women, you can't wear pants, you can't cut your hair, can't wear makeup, no jewelry, not even a wedding ring. And my mother, because she went to her uncle's church, um, he decided to use her as an example for repentance one Sunday because my mother and my aunt Sally had black hair, like raven black hair. And the rule in that church that he imposed was girls were not allowed to shave their legs, or women. Well, my mother turned 14, and she was embarrassed because she had dark hair. So she decided to bleach the hair on her legs. So at least you couldn't see it as well. So my uncle, her uncle, found out and made her stand in front of the whole congregation and repent for bleaching the hair on her legs. Absolute abuse. But my mother... Her heart was so tender toward the Lord. She never wanted to grieve the Lord. So anything that was asked of her, she would go the second mile. And it made a mark on her. 
My mother fasted every Monday, every single Monday through high school. She had a beehive higher than Marge Simpson. (laughs) 14 and going to school with a beehive. She couldn't cut her hair. And they couldn't wear it down either because it was too beautiful to wear down. So you had to be as ugly as possible, I think was the point. (laughs) But her heart was so tender toward the Lord that that holiness, even though the method was wrong, because I think religion has proven to all of us that holiness that is mandated from the outside in does not work. You know why I know it doesn't work? Because this man, this pastor, was one of the most evil, mean-spirited, deceptive humans that we've ever known. He ran off more people than I think he ever helped. But he could be in that holiness movement and thrive and be, and be honored as a leader. But the internal wasn't holy. We know that holiness from the outside in is not right. But when holiness comes from the inside out, when it is a decision to dedicate yourself, like my mother and my Aunt Sally, my Uncle Joe, the three of them, They could sing the paint off the walls. They traveled the world, and the power of the Holy Spirit would fall. I'm telling you, my Aunt Sally could preach a song when she sang. You didn't know what color skin she had either. Most people believed she was a different race when they heard her sing. She had power, and when she would sing, they were in the upper room, in one accord. You remember? And you can break up. Gather together, 120. To receive the power God promised to sin. Okay, so when they would sing, we got to bring back some of those songs. They didn't let the artificial holiness steal the authentic, sacred, set apart, consecrated heart that they had. Don't let that happen to you either. There are a lot of things about church that's imperfect. Everybody doesn't make the right decisions. But it is your decision to say, I consecrate myself. I give myself to the Lord. Remember when I was just reading to you in 2 Corinthians where he said, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And then he describes, I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters. You know the picture I get It reminds me of a meme that I saw at Christmas and it said, at Christmas when you're with family and you see a toddler running towards you, it's not a toddler, it's COVID or the flu. (laughs) And it reminded me of when my kids were toddlers and they would be playing and touching God knows what. And then they would come and wanna touch your face. You hold them. My mother would grab their hands and smell their fingers first. (laughs) We have a bad story that goes with that. (laughs) Yeah. I'll just tell you one time Stacy thought one of the kids had a boo-boo because he was crying and holding up his hand. It wasn't a boo-boo. It was a (laughs) poo-poo. But this is how God's describing in this verse You want to know what the will of God is? You have to spend time in his arms, in his presence. And he's promising here because he cannot cohabitate with sin. So you're going to play around, do whatever you want that you know is a sin because there's grace and you know you're going to be forgiven. So I'll come back and I'll reach my arms up and say, God, pick me up. Father God, I need help. And he spends all his time with you, the time you allow him in your life to clean you back up, to hold you again, to put you back together, to put clean clothes on you and restore you. But you don't give enough time again before having to come back and get cleaned up. Up again. He's saying, if you want my time and attention, stop playing in the mud. Spend more time at my table. I have things for you. Don't, don't make me have to continually use the blood every single time. I'll do it, but we are starting over every time you pray. We're going back to the ground zero. We can't ever build anything together. We can't ever move forward together because we always have to start here. 
The do nots are really powerful in this passage. Holiness begins with no. See, we live in a culture where we don't wanna move on to something new until we have something better than what we've got. We won't let go of the old thing. We're not gonna break up with, with brother right now until brother perfect shows up. And so because there is no gap, there is no faith. And when there is no faith, there is no substance. And when there is no substance, God says, you aren't ready for what I have for you. I'll let you stay in that stuck, yoked position as long as you want to. But you're gonna have to unyoke yourself from what your current belief is. If you want your life to change, it's time to look at your life and say, where am I wasting it right now? How can I give more to the kingdom, to what God's called me to do? I'm gonna have to say no to some things. I'm gonna have to be lonely for a while. I'm gonna have to separate. This is why fasting is such a powerful part of our holiness journey. You know, and holiness can tend to have a religious spirit that likes to hijack the power of holiness. And I wanna speak to this for a moment because when God is dealing with you with holiness and bringing conviction with you, it doesn't mean that's a word for everybody else. Every time I get up to, to minister in the weeks preparing, I go, God, now is this just what you're speaking to me? Is this just for me? Or is this for everyone else? Because I gotta receive it. If it's for me and it's correction for me, most of the time when it's correction for me and it does its work, then I realize I'm not the only one that the Holy Spirit is, is directing in this way. But when holy, holiness is hijacked by religion, what happens is, is we'll go, you know, the Holy Spirit is just really dealing with me about listening to secular music. You know, I, I just can't, it's, I don't wanna have any of that in my spirit. But then we look at their life and their Instagram and their posts and there's half naked outfits and clothes and bikinis on the beach and margaritas in the hand and we look at everything else going, oh God's only dealing with you about that, huh? It's hard not to get judgy, right? But what we have to remember is when God convicts us about something, it's because what he's put you on the planet to do, only you can do. And there are vices, there are weapons formed against you that God wants to speak to. And when he says, listen, girlfriend, everybody else in your circle might get by with this, but this is kryptonite for you. Don't touch it. Don't do it. Be separate. Stay away from it. It will defile you. But we want to look at everybody else and go, well, it's, they, they get by with it. Well, let the Holy Spirit deal with them. But let's come into a place of going, God, how am I supposed to be holy? Because when I, I look at people online and they preach about different things like the secular music, I'm going, I know, I don't get in my car and turn on, uh, we listen to Yacht Rock, sorry. We love 70s and 80s music, but, but ain't nobody gonna tell me that Marvin Gaye isn't anointed when Stacy and I decide to have a, a sexy night at home. I'm going, we, that, there is a place for that good music. There's a sanctified place for that soundtrack. Now, I totally understand, I get it, why it can be some people's vice and all that, but I'm going, I, in the right place, because listen, you can get all head up against secular music and I wanna go, okay, well, let's talk about Christian music because you know there are people that are in the Christian music world and they aren't Christians, but they're singing Christian music because they can and it will sell. And so are we talking about the people who write the songs because all the people who write the songs aren't necessarily Christians? Are we talking about the label who's not Christian at all? It's an institution. What are we talking about? We're talking about your spirit and my spirit. We're talking about what the Holy Spirit convicts what feels right, what he challenges us on and says, that's not, you could have a degree with all the time you've wasted online. You could have uh, resources and relationships 
if you'd stop wasting your life on this. Holiness is a personal conversation with the Holy Spirit. Don't let religion hijack it for you. Allow the Holy Spirit to have a voice with you. Because what I notice is people often want to fast things that they don't even have a tendency toward. We were laughing on the road trip over here about people who've said, alcohol has never touched my lips. And I love that. That's wonderful. But I want to say that's not your vice. We all know what your vice is. (laughs) And it it, it ain't that, but it is something uh, as a destructive Can we talk about that? So we all know it can lead us down this path of being judging other people, but holiness is about intimate relationship with God. And he cannot bring you up into his arms when you continually choose to defile. He'll he'll clean you up. He'll get you ready for that hug. But I don't want to start over every time I have an encounter with him. I want to build something together with him in the time I've got on this planet. I know you do too, or you wouldn't be here. So do not be yoked was a big part of this. Romans 12, 2, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I know I say that all the time, but it is, because it's your favorite when it just hits right, right? It just always hits. And it begins with the words, do not. Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. You wanna know what the will of God is for your life? You're gonna have to start saying no to some of the things you've been given your big yes to. You got a better yes, but you gotta make room for that. Faith is the substance. It requires something of us, a gap. And in that moment, that holy isolation, being able to say, Father God, whatever you want to produce in me, this womb is empty and ready to conceive what it is you want to give this planet right now. And see, this is the thing. A lot of people... They harp, especially some denominations. The Catholic Church, they worship Mary. Um, she, I don't believe in Mary as a deity. She was human, but she was chosen. And a lot of times we focus on the fact that she was a virgin. And she was, and she had to be. She needed to be. But the reason wasn't just because of purity's sake, even though it was in, not in a sexual sense. It was because God had to know whatever he planted in her could not be confused with the seed from man, all God. This is why there are seasons of separation. This is why God will say, I need you to step away from that because I'm bringing you into a fertile season and I wanna plant something in you, but I don't want what I'm gonna plant in you to be confused with anything else, anybody else's lie or idea. It's time for you to set yourself apart. What can we do? to be more holy every day. It's not religious, it's love. Why don't you stand with me today as we wrap up this service. There's something we do in the church and it can seem churchy, but it's honestly a universal language. And it's the act of just putting up our hands like this. When we do this, All over the world, you can be in Paris and not speak French. You can be in Russia and not speak Russian. When you raise your hands, when an officer stops you, it's surrender. I'm not your enemy. I'm subservient. That's what this means. It isn't some weird, super spiritual. It's I surrender, God, I surrender. I'm open. Today, this call of holiness is a call to surrender, to stop trying to make things happen on your own 
And then calling God in to look at your life as if he's some self-help guru. He's not. He is your maker. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you're struggling with. There's no reason to lie to him or to pretend. It's just, I surrender, God. Come in. Make me new. I want to pull away from the things I've been yoked to, from the agreements I've made. Can I cover you today in prayer? Can we agree together? for freedom and deliverance. Father, you know the things that are holding your children captive. The addictions, the systemic waste of life, the enemy has orchestrated just phenomenal entertainment that has pulled us away and has defiled us for a greater purpose. God, it's filled our mind with, with, with chaos and confusion. Lord, we thank you right now for unyoking us as we surrender, unyoking us from the vices that would pull us away from the greater purpose on our lives, unyoking us for the need for affirmation or attention, unyoking us from those relationships that Lord over us, where their opinion is the one we are most fearful of. God, we repent today for being afraid of anyone besides you. There is no God but you. We're not afraid of failure. We're afraid of failing you. So Father, we thank you as we put our arms up today that you see the areas of our lives that we could surrender, that you wanna produce something powerful in in this season. We thank you, Father, that holiness will preserve our purpose to make a difference in the world as you've called us to, as you've created us to. God, I thank you right now that however we are yoked, I feel really strongly right now that there are people that are yoked to expectation and there are some things right now you need to let go and delegate because God's got you on the planet to do something only you can do and your hands are in too many details. It's time for you to delegate. It's time for you to let go. It's time for you to release and empower so that you can move to what God has for you. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for the release that comes from surrender today, that your spirit goes in, that it moves into every part of our hearts, our minds, our lives. And God, we receive you today as a welcome guest. We know that our mind is the heart that we give to you. So we ask, Father, that in any way, where Belial, the liar, has had an impact or effect on our thinking. God, that you undo and show us where we've been believing a lie. We repent and we come out of agreement with every lie in the name of Jesus. As you show it to us in the future, we commend ourselves to do it by the Spirit. Strengthen us in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you right now that as we feel the yokes break right now, that we step into agreement and alignment with you because your yoke is easy, your burden is light. We take that on right now and we follow you in Jesus' name. We thank you for peace, harmony, and agreement in our everyday lives. In the name of Jesus. I wanna pray for anyone today who wants to make Jesus Lord and Savior. If you're here in this room and you're not sure that you'll spend eternity with him, it's not just about where you go when you die, but you definitely need to know that because it is appointed for all men to die and then to be stood in front of the judgment seat. For Jesus to look at you and say, I knew you. We have relationship and to let you in. That's the honor of your life. If you wanna make Jesus Lord and Savior today, I want you to slip up your hand with everybody's head bowed, eyes closed right now across this room. I see those hands. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Thank you, Jesus. 22. 23, 24, 25, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, 26, 27, 28, 29, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, 30, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, 
Thank you, Jesus. Now, everyone who's raised your hand, you're not gonna pray this prayer alone, but the Bible says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus came and that he lived a perfect life, that he died for you and that he rose again, and you declare that belief with your mouth, that you're received as a son and as a daughter to have a relationship with him, that you're redeemed, your life is redeemed from the curse. So if you wanna pray this prayer with us, you raised your hand, we're gonna pray it together. Repeat this after me, Father God, I love you. And I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for my sin. Jesus, I repent. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come into my life and make me clean. From this day forward, I'll follow you. I'll walk away from anything else that takes me away from your will. In Jesus' name I pray. And with these words, I believe that I am saved. Let's give the Lord a shout. 30. Woo! Come on. What a harvest. God has a plan for your life. If you heard this message today and it resonates with you, it's time to stop wasting time. You don't have time to waste. And I'll tell you the only reason I'm up here doing what I'm doing is because I understand there is no reason to be on the planet if I'm not gonna make a difference. It's the same is true for you. God wants to give you a purpose that's so much greater than a paycheck. It's not just living to pay your bills, to wake up another day. You've got a greater purpose on your life. Ask the Lord this week, show me what I need to say no to. What do I need to step away from so that you can conceive some new things in my heart, my spirit? Will you do that with me this week? Amen. Can I bless you as we go? If you prayed that prayer, you can text 5466, I think. Five, uh, whatever it says on the screen, <laughs> saved to 54636, or you can scan the code on the back. We wanna give you a devotional. Let me bless you as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you with his name. Jesus, good day and God bless you. We love you.